Today we're going to talk about the cheap or very very cheap phones and at the same time review the Pixie 4 4 inch version. So when it comes to all this cheap low-end bargain bin phones, they focus a lot on the paper, meaning the spec sheet and all the features that is listed on the spec sheet. And typically, they like to compromise on a few areas that you won't notice just by looking at the spec sheet, be it in store or online, but you will notice when using the device. Compromise 1, screen. On many cheap phones, the displays usually have a decent resolution, usually 480p up. However, a 480p screen of this is very different from a Samsung Galaxy S screen from 2010. Chip LCD panels always have this trait, which is terrible viewing angles, like on this phone. Usually the viewing angles get very washed out or very contrasty at a certain plane. So for example, this phone is in the vertical plane, in the horizontal plane, not so much. And at the same time, they're usually not so saturated and contrasty. Same here, colors look pretty muted even on the boosted color options in the phone settings. The glass of these low-end phones can be worse as well. Either the distance between the panel and the glass is quite big, or the screen has no oleophobic coating to prevent fingerprints from sticking. This one has not too big of an issue with the former, but the latter shows up the moment you use the phone. Like look at the difference between this and that. Come on. Does that mean that the display is unusable? Not at all. It's perfectly fine for viewing text, but it's definitely not the prime choice for watching an hour-long movie. Second thing is touch responsiveness. Not only is the display not as good as the low to mid-range category, touch responsiveness usually is worse on the bargain bin phones. You can have things like poor drivers or just the capacitive panel that makes like dragging around and tapping around feel laggy and have a certain delay. Thankfully, that's not the case with this Pixie 4, uh, but I definitely had that case with other devices such as the Mi Force Wi-Fi L. That phone screen was so bad that trying to type at any reasonable speed was bad. So that's a very rare occurrence, but on cheap phones, usually what they compromise on is that the display only can detect up to two fingers. Now on most phones, it can detect up to five. But Adro, that doesn't make a big difference, right? I mean, when I'm gaming, I'm only using two dumbs most of the time. And when I'm texting, it's, again, two dumbs. It's not as if I have three. I'm gonna completely skip over the gaming part, but for texting, it actually makes a difference because if you type quickly, just having an extra finger of support is great because sometimes what would happen is that the capacitive screen kind of just fast enough and it would just miss a character. So actually having more touch target support is useful. It's definitely not the end of the world. On this phone, I can type at a reasonable speed with no issue. But for fast typers, stay away. Number 3. Sensors. Notice on the top here how we have cool features like a front flash? Well, it's actually missing something up there. On most phones, we have a camera and also a small part here. And this small part is very important because it holds things such as ambient light sensors and sensors so that it knows how close it is from your ear. Ambient light sensors detect how much light there is and subsequently controls auto brightness, which is not a big deal as you can manually adjust your brightness, but when it comes to the proximity sensor, it's a big deal. Why? Because your phone doesn't turn off the display when you're on a phone call. Now some manufacturers do find ways around this. On Samsung phones that don't have the sensor, you double tap the screen to unlock it when on the call, and then you can hang up the call. On this phone, it actually detects if something is touching the top layer of the phone when on a phone call, and you actually just turn off the screen. And then there's some manufacturers that plain don't do that. And that's awful. But this doesn't mean that it's a perfect solution. What is my work fine for the default calling phone app on this phone? One word, VoIP. Well, technically that's not a word, that's an abbreviation. Skype, Viber, WhatsApp, Duo, or the, there's so many options out there. They assume your phone has the sensor, so it doesn't really know what to do when you put it to your face. It, the screen still remains on, basically. Though that being said, on the Pixie 4, it has a nice feature where actually it emulates it. And that's not to mention things like compasses, might be missed out, and as a result, Google Maps can't tell which direction you're looking at. Number four, poor speakers and headphone output. Now to try to save costs, some phone manufacturers will remove as many speakers as they can. So for example, this Pixie 4 right here has only one speaker, and that's the earpiece, which pulls double duty as a earpiece and a main speaker. I see these on multiple cheap devices. It's generally not a good thing. Uh, first of all, cheap phones means compromise, which means they usually don't sound that good in the first place. So front facing or not, poor sound quality. Second thing, especially with phones without the sensor, remember that this speaker can ring 
when it's next to your year. So let's just say the call drops and then a guy calls you again while your year is next to the phone like this. I speak from experience. And headphone jack output on these cheap phones usually aren't that great. On some phones you get very bad background hits. Thankfully this isn't one of them. Number 5. The camera. Well duh, the camera's obviously bad. But that's not what I'm trying to say. Remember, all these phone manufacturers are fighting to get the best spec sheet possible at the lowest price. So they try to omit things that you might not notice unless you have a sharp eye. For example, this phone. 8 megapixel camera. Sounds pretty darn good. But they forgot to tell you that it scaled up to 8 megapixel with their enhancement technology. And the sensor behind it, well, it's not really 8 megapixel. And they also forgot to tell you that it's a fixed focus camera. At least we have a LED flash. And the same thing applies to the front. The front is advertised as 5 megapixels. Uh, it, it, it's not 5 megapixels. And even the front facing flash can't save it from the awfulness that it is. It's not the worst I've seen, to be fair, but it's not great. And so is the back camera, it's not great in any way. I mean, no autofocus, it's blurry, it's... It's not a good camera. Number 6. Software support. Look, it doesn't make sense for a manufacturer to support the lowest end phone. Why invest money into developing software updates for this phone when the people buying it probably have close to zero brand loyalty? And it's not as if the phone's making them much money anyways. So generally, software support is very limited. You might not get security update packages. You definitely will not get base system upgrades. This is on 5th February 2017. And this phone got announced roughly around then too, so... And some bugs will definitely go unpatched. Thankfully, I haven't experienced any significant bug on this phone yet. Depending on how popular that phone is, you might have some decent custom ROM support. So that might be a lifesaver. But always do your research first if it matters to you. Number 7. Ads. Sometimes in a way to try to subsidize the cost, the manufacturer will insert ads into things like the launcher, notifications, and the Nephos is no exception. If you update the home screen launcher, you have ads. Recently there was an article published where Alcatel was pushing ads into everything. And it's not just on Alcatel's side, I mean, Xiaomi kind of does it in their security app as well. But that's how they try to subsidize the phone cost. And lastly, the internals of these phones usually aren't that great. And I'm not talking about the big things like RAM and processor. That has actually improved a lot because remember, spec sheet, spec sheet. For example, this has a quad-core 1.3GHz processor and 1GB of RAM, 8GB of storage. Pretty decent. But you might forget things like battery. For example, this is 1,500mAh. Very small. And more importantly, charging. It's a micro USB port on the bottom. That's no big issue. Makes sense for the people that this phone is targeting. But unfortunately, the included charger charges at a rate that is 5 volts and 0.5 amp. That's 2.5 watts. In comparison, most low-end phones charge at least 5 watts to 10 watts. So not only is the battery capacity of this small, it's a slow charger as well. So I mean, paired together, it charges at a normal rate, but battery life is still quite poor. And before you ask me if I tested it on auto chargers, yes, it's still 5 volts, 0.5 amps. Didn't read that on a box, did ya? But that doesn't mean that these devices are unusable. They have a lot of flaw, and generally they're not the best bang for your buck if you could spend a little bit more to get that low-end phone instead of the bargain bin cheapest phone that they have. I like to play low-end phones and they've generally been pretty well built, including this one. And some even include nice things like a screen protector, earphones, phones in a more expensive price brackets don't include. And like I said before, it's not as if the phones are unusable. The processors and the internals are usually enough to chug along with things like WhatsApp, simple web browsing, Facebook Lite, lightweight apps. So for backup devices, disposable devices, or heck, even using it as a daily device, as your main communication portal, it's still a very usable experience. And it can be useful for things like home automation or little projects here and there. So don't discount these kind of phones because as crappily and as much loss as they have, they typically are pretty usable. And that includes this little guy here. It's not speedy, you definitely notice drop frames here and there, lag, but it's a usable phone for basic things. And considering the price jump between a bargain bin phone and maybe the next tier? It can be a huge jump, sometimes even two times the cost. So for those who cannot splurge, honestly, 
this ain't half bad. They've improved a lot from a long time ago. So thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you found it informative. I'm interested to hear you. What do you think is the minimum spec phone that you can live with? While you're leaving a comment down below, why don't you hit that subscribe button near there and subscribe because I talk about tech, I talk about phones, I love phones, and I talk about how to's and stuff like that. So if you're interested in that, subscribe. Thank you guys so much for watching and listening. Have a good day, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye.